Welcome to the Adventures in CRE audio series. Join Michael Belasco and Spencer Burton as they pull back the curtain on everything commercial real estate and introduce you to some of the top minds in the industry. If you want to take your skills to the next level and be part of a growing community of CRE professionals across the world, this is for you. All right. Welcome back. Uh, we are still in season three. We've got some really interesting con uh, content here for you today. Um, but I want to say just on the heels of season three, we've been really focusing a lot on the deal making and the deal doing, as you know. Um, and we thought it would be fun as we create additional episodes and podcasts in this season in particular to start teaming up and, and getting the input and opinions and ideas of people in those particular phases. And so today we've got a special guest, uh, Scott Choppin from Urban Pacific. And, uh, you know, we're going to be talking, we're not entirely sure what the topic is and we kind of <laughs> like that to be completely honest with you. In fact, the discussion leading into this podcast today was extremely interesting. I don't know where it's going, but I do know that, uh, you're going to get insights into, uh, you know, the development side, as well as other things happening from an actual deal doer and maker um, in the business. So Scott, uh, with without uh, any, I mean, again, this is a conversation. I'd love yeah. to hear um, more about you. Our audience would love to get to know you. So why don't you go ahead and let's start by an introduction of you and your company to uh, the Adventures in Siri audience. Sure. No, I appreciate that. And great to be here, guys. Thank, thank you for the invite. So yeah, just a little bit of background. Um, Scott Choppin, founder and CEO of the Urban Pacific Group of Companies. We're a real estate development company based in Southern California. Um, my background and the businesses I've been doing this, you know, my almost my entire uh, adult life. Um, started, you know, my my family was in the development business, so I started working on job sites when I was 16, picking up trash and you know doing the stuff that teenagers do and not liking it. By the way, <laughs> rebellious <laughs> teenager. Um, and then fast forward, you know, to the, you know, when I was about 18 or 19, I, I finally sort of, it, it all came together for me where I, I decided that like with the background, I knew about real estate development. I wasn't a real estate developer. I was, you know, too young at that point and sort of like the idea of being an entrepreneur and, and working for myself and those sort of, you know, merged together, uh, to give me the, you know, the, the plan I needed to execute in order to like become hopefully successful in the future when I did that, which meant like go to college, get a degree in finance, which I did. And then I spent several years, as we were talking about earlier, working for some very large, uh, you know, development companies. Uh, one was called Kaufman and Broad, uh, now called KB Home, which is a home building company. Yeah. Uh, but I worked for a division of theirs that built apartment buildings on behalf of the corporation. So this wasn't a retail offer. This was like a corporate investment structure. And I spent several years there and then worked for a couple other companies. And then in 2000, year 2000, I uh, left to form Urban Pacific. Uh, so we celebrated our 21st year of operations, uh, like as our own development company with me as the, the, you know, the lead strategist, CEO and founder. And then uh, fast forward to, you know, recently we focused on urban infill that entire 21 years. And then the last five has just been all on workforce housing, our specific, you know, creation of a specific product type. And then just a little bit about me, family background uh, together and married uh, to my wife, Becky, for 28 years. Uh, and then we have three kids, uh, 20 years old, uh, college, uh, uh, sophomore, actually junior this year. And then, uh, my younger son is a senior in high school and my daughter is a freshman. Actually, they're both in high school together this year. Um, and so that's sort of a, in a nutshell, you know, about me. Good. Well, Scott, first off, thank you for, for joining us. Um, uh, you're a true seasoned developer. Um, <laughs> all the, the, the bruises and cuts that go, go along with it. Um, yes. uh, I spent the first decade of my career in development. Uh, I intentionally transitioned into an investment role because uh, I don't have um, the 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 will that a, a true developer takes to 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 do it. So, um, really excited to have you on. Let me ask you, uh, kind of kick off the discussion. Um, so, you described 21 years um, as a, a developer, Urban Pacific, 
And then you said the last five or six years, you, you transitioned to exclusively targeting the workforce housing space. Mm -hmm. Why, why that transition? What was it about workforce housing in particular yeah. that, that interested you? Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. So, you know, part of my background working at Kaufman or Bro or KVMH, as we called it, Multi Housing Group was the name of that. We we developed affordable housing projects, so rental housing that uses government programs to subsidize the rents. And I, what I always uh, uh, identified in that was uh, in the family a product that we did, family housing. Um, there was just a vast need of, you know, housing never enough, right? That's the sort of the one of the flaws in the government subsidized programs. I mean, they're, they're, they're very beneficial when they're built, but they're incredibly expensive to build. And there's always a finite amount of subsidy, right? The government can only fund so much subsidy before it runs out. Like there's never enough and, right. you know, never will be enough. It's like always finite. Um, and that's not, I don't say that's a bad thing. That's just the reality of that. Right. And so, you know, all through that 21 years, you know, we, we focused on urban infill, we did market rate rental, um, we did, you know, condo product, we did some affordable housing. And I, and I really always enjoyed doing the rental housing. That was like, when I look at our track record, we've done most rental housing. That's what I've always gravitated to. About five years ago, we were finishing a series of projects. So this would be 2016, 2017 era. Um, we, we, we had mostly recovered from the recession, right? Like the recession officially ended in 2010, 2011 from the 2008 recession. Um, we, we got, bought a bunch of distressed asset, but land deals and half built buildings completed those did really well. But in 2016, 2017, there was a weird little flat spot on the market where investors and, and debt uh, lenders sort of had pulled back. Like they started to perceive that a lot of product was starting to come online in that era right now that we'd fully recovered from the recession and people were gearing back up like all the big boys were starting to to gear up and do a lot more stuff and so the lenders and investors like had learned their lesson from 2008 so they were really wary so they you know they were really like hair trigger to pull back right yeah and not a bad thing i i don't say that's a bad thing we were we were that way too so that this flat spot in that era really prompted us we like we'd sold a bunch of stuff we did really well but it just it, it like had us be in a moment of pause and go, look, well, OK, so what is out there? What should we be thinking about? What can the future look like? And, and particularly, how do we differentiate? Because one of the things with all this product coming online, it was true. It was but it was all these big, you know, Trammell Crow and, you know, JPI and, you know, like all the big development guys in the apartment sector. And I basically made the determination that we didn't want to like we, we wouldn't. And I didn't want to choose to compete head to head with those companies, right? They would, you know, would would kill us on capital costs, on the ability to execute. And particularly what I was thinking about in that era was what happens when a recession comes? Yeah. So we were, we had been, you know, whatever, five or six years out of the 2008 recession um, by that point and going, okay, it's, we got, you know, another five years plus or minus till the next one come. We we're very like, you know, vigilant is the term I use. And so I just started to look for a product category that was going to be recession resilient, which is, all, you know, that term I created several years after we started to look for it. But I wanted a product type that would be defensive in a downturn that had like some, you know, some like good social impact feel to it. Right. It wasn't just, you know, we're there to make money. And by the way, we do orient around being profitable. Right. We need to take care of our families, take care of our investors, produce yield, good projects. Um, so we landed on this because of my background in family housing. We started to think about like, is there housing type we could serve moderate income families? So you got luxury with high income families or individuals, you got affordable or you've got lower income families. What about those people in the middle? They're working class, maybe, maybe we think middle class. Um, they make good money, but they don't make enough money to necessarily afford the brand new product. And more importantly, there's nobody really in the development marketplace that's serving them, right? They, they're they building one bedroom apartments in downtown Los Angeles. Your family of, you know, four or six or eight, like, you know, we have families that are that big in our housing, like that housing doesn't make sense to them. So we ultimately, you know, within a couple of years of starting that, uh, develop what we now call the urban townhouse model. That's our name for it, which is a, as we described earlier, is a five bedroom, four bath, three story townhouse product attached row home style two car garage you know nice finishes you know basically market rate standard but we're basically because of the five bedroom four bath serving these 
what are ultimately are multi-generational, multi-earner middle income families. Interesting. That was a lot. So, <laughs> so um, you know, as I first off the the pivot makes a lot of sense if you can even call a pivot. I mean, you'd had extensive experience in in the multifamily development space, but pivoting now to call it a niche within that space. Yeah. made a lot of sense, especially the, the previous cycle. I think we're in a new cycle post COVID, but in the previous cycle, it seems like everyone is doing luxury apartments, right? Yeah. <laughs> in fact, everything branded is a luxury apartment, whether it's luxury or not. And, and so carving out a, a, a niche and call it workforce housing makes a lot of sense. Um, so m many of the, the listeners know I spent six, almost seven years building what's essentially workforce housing in Central America. Mm. And one of the biggest challenges we had was the razor thin margins of that business. Mm -hmm. Is that a challenge that, that you experience? And if so, how, how are, how, how are you handling that? How are you able to, to, to earn a profit for yourself and your investor partners while also delivering a product that's, that's a for a relatively affordable. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the age old question, right? Like, you know, how do you like have the rents be affordable and, you know, we're in California. So the, we have the, highest cost structures in the United States, yeah. like statewide. Um, so for sure, we've been dealing with that for a long time. And really for the UTH program, there's the, the answer is there's several different parts of the model or the design or the, the, the type typology of the unit that, that fulfill this dual role or dual mandate of keeping the, the units affordable in, in co comparison to the market while making a profit right yeah. so that's 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 the challenge and really where we see the real the, the real you know center of that capability to do both those is in this five bedroom unit okay and why that why that is important is because we don't covenant or restrict our units like if you do government subsidized housing they they give you extra money they you know government subsidy and they buy down the rent basically yep. you just right. charge less rent and and probably for your product in Central America, it was just to you know get the rents down, right? But what is sort of left out of that model, and I and it's no criticism. I mean, it's highly needed. It's a great product. I mean, it's it's you know it's the most amazing, valuable product. I mean, government subsidized, true affordable housing, as they call it. But it's not enough to meet the larger needs of the marketplace, and it's not meeting these middle income families, right? So when we started to really where this came out of is we developed one so when we started to explore ideas in this flat spot in this 2016 era we were looking at various different things what we knew is we didn't want to do the podium you know mid-density you know urban product one bedroom studios that everybody was doing all all that supply that yep. was coming online and so we started just explore different like what you know different projects different land sites what could we do there and we landed on one specific project that had an interesting like dichotomy one was we were lit. We had a specific unit count that we could develop on the site, but we weren't limited on the size of the unit. And so I go, okay, this is interesting. I hadn't seen this before. And so we we bought the land really well. We bought it, you know, inexpensively. So it gave us a lot of latitude to experiment, right? Like we weren't gonna, you know, we weren't gonna mess it up too badly if the experiment didn't, you know, turn it out. And so in that project, we we said, okay, we can make the units bigger. I go, okay, I've never had this problem before yeah. so, so the architect how many bedrooms can we fit like i go okay if we're going to be limited on units but can do a big let's make them big right so we ended up developing a two-story four bedroom three bath townhouse product with a garage right and that was what fit on the site and it worked and in fact we underwrote at the time the rents were 2650 okay when we finished that and sold it in that early phase we sold a lot of these projects now we're holding everything um, we, we sold it uh, to a buyer who didn't want us to rent it. They wanted it empty. They wanted it to occupy with their own tenants, right? They managed it themselves. And so they turn around, they put it out on the market at 3250 And I remember calling my you know partner in the deal, his investor and partner in the deal, and I was like, do you think he could get these rents? Like, did, what did we miss? Like, yeah. dude, we, met, we missed something here. I was like, I call him immediately. And he was sort of like, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to get them, right? And so they ended up getting them. That mm -hmm. rent, I think they were like twenty nine fifty to thirty two fifty, but way above twenty six fifty was the was the bottom line, and so that was really the seed of the UTH model. So yeah. so basically, what we found was we we're able to generate a high whole dollar rent relative to the cost of the unit, right? In development, it's always what do you generate in income 
uh, as a function of the cost that you expended to develop that income producing unit, right? In fact, we call it NOI to cost, which is sure. net operating income that you generate relative to the dollar that you spend to do that. And these high whole dollar rents, while they're higher rents, what's what's really the secret about it is that these five bedroom units are, are shared by family groups that are predominantly multi-earner, multi-gen families. So mm-hmm. think a Hispanic family that lives in Southern California and they have, you know, let's say eight people in the family or six or four, right? We have all kinds of different family sizes, but the key is that they'll have usually three to five income earners in the family. And that's the real secret to this because most people they rent to one income, or at least statistically you see in the media, they go, oh, you need to make, you know, $47 an hour to afford the average two bedroom unit. Like, you know, and I'm making those stats up, you guys get the point. What's not talked about is what if you have two earners or three earners or four earners, and all of a sudden it throws them into a much different category of income relative to the rent. So while the rent may be 3,500 a month, that's where we're at 35 to 3,700 a month, as a percentage of the family's income, it starts to be at or below 30%, which you guys know is sort of like the magic rule of thumb for how much rent should a family pay where they can have good leftover discretionary income and 30% of income is, is sort of the magic number. And I don't say that's the right or wrong number. That's just like sort of the standard. So the affordability is naturally occurring, right? It's produced because the number of income earners in the unit because of the large bedroom count and the family structure of these economic sharing lifestyle families affords it more naturally and easily. In fact, the, the, uh, the, the rates of poverty among multi-generational families is incredibly low. Like when families combine together from an, in an economic sharing lifestyle, which by the way, most of these families uh, from, you know, if they've immigrated or they're from a culture that lives multi-generational, it's their natural way of, of having yeah. their family live together. Yeah, that's like right. they, they wouldn't even think to have, you know, their grandparent live separate. Yeah. Like that would yeah. be like foreign to them. They're like, or even adult kids, right? You know, I don't know about you guys, but you know, when I was 17 and a half, it was pretty clear with, you know, my dad and I, like it was time to get out. Right. Yeah, oh, yeah. And I don't like, I don't fault him. And, but I like for me now with my family, I go, well, like stay. Right. I mean, you know, you gotta, we gotta live together appropriately. I mean, my, my oldest is at college and he, I don't know if he'll move back, but like orientation was like, Hey, like stay if you want don't feel forced to go out and and get a a job that you got to then pay rent and that money goes down the down the rabbit hole um so i think the the idea of economic sharing and multi-generational living is starting to become more accepted in the american culture um and that's partly to do for economics right economics are, are requiring families to live together to produce the incomes that make them have a good life or culturally this is how the families approach it and they may be practicing economic sharing and two two bedroom units side by side. Like the market hasn't given them a unit where they can practice their multi-gen lifestyle. That's what yeah. our unit does. So here, here's a question that hopefully dovetails into that last statement you made. In fact, I was thinking this as you tailed off. I was like, oh, well, this, this is perfect. So you had this moment where somebody buys your unit. They rent it out. You guys have maybe this epiphany of, hey, well, what if we're missing, you know, like we started out maybe more broad in this sector and now we're even going more narrow. Mm -hmm. Did you change your product as far as like the design of the product to accommodate, you know, this specific behavior? It, we did, yeah. No, that's it. That, you're the first person to like ask that question to watch that transition. So when we saw the success of the four bedroom, I called the architect and I go, okay, what, okay, so this four bedroom worked great. Like, what do we do to make it to enhance that, to amplify that, right? I go five bedrooms, six bedrooms, right? So we batted it around a little bit and we landed on probably six seemed too extreme, although five is pretty darn, darn extreme itself. Um, but what we did is we we went to a five bedroom model because I we, we sort of did some math. We go, we think this whole dollar rent can grow even more, uh, enable the capability to economic share even further. But we did one key thing is we tightened up the footprint and went to a three-story model mm. with the garage, ground floor garage, but we shrunk the footprint just to be enough to do the garage and one bedroom and bathroom that's on the ground floor to accommodate the, you know, somebody who's got mobility issues like a grandparent or an older in-law. In fact, that's a standard in all of our units to have that ground floor bedroom bathroom, but we shrunk the footprint to as tight as we could 
in order to put more units on the ground, right? Like, you know, increasing density is always the move that developers are looking to do. Oh, like I got to get more units appropriate for your product and your strategy, you know, of your, of your business plan. And so that actually was um, a key move for us because when we look back on our like earlier projects, we could have gotten more units in each project, but that's fine. It was the experiment and it, and it proved the things that we need to prove. Um, and now we've standardized to that five bedroom, four bath, three story townhouse. That's like, in fact, we really do every project that that's the predominant product type. Um, and in fact, in many projects, it's the exclusive uh, design, which also gives us some capabilities and just doing production oriented housing. When we build, we're just doing the same unit over and over again. So the yeah. subs know it, our designers yeah. know it, you know, we got the same specs. And then just recently in the last, you know, probably year, we've started to uh, experiment a li little bit with a two bedroom, three story townhouse with a garage on the ground floor. And that's like sort of accommodate some, you know, additional, you know, like, let's say you had a density that you could get, you know, 55 and a half units on a site, we would normally round down to 55. But now we're going, hey, can that that two bedroom fit and get that half a unit more of density? It, it only fits in certain places. But we're just sort of like at the edges of the design of the core of the five bedroom design, doing two bedrooms. And then more recently, we're looking at doing uh, what's called an accessory dwelling unit. You guys may have talked about that ADUs. And we'll actually gar garage convert one of our new garages into this studio unit. Uh, and we have literally one project that and one garage that we're looking at to convert because we want to see the experiment again, prove itself out. Like we're really big into like testing new things on a basis where if it doesn't work, we're not like killed, <laughs> yeah. you know, from a from an economic standpoint. And if it doesn't go as well as we thought, well, OK, fine, that experiment didn't work. Um, but we'll start to add, you know, on the, on the margins of this core design. We know the five bedroom works. That's solid. That's proven over several projects. And now we just start to enhance them with these new designs. So this is really interesting, Sam. Um, so it's season, season three, it's all about deal making. And when we say making, it's, it's very much developing strategies, identifying yes. assets. And then the deal doing is, is actually executing on the plan. Um, mm -hmm. And what you've described first is, um, this process through which you developed a strategy. It almost kind of fell in your lap, right? Um, you were at the right place in the right time, and you were developing, you were in the business, and all of a sudden you, you developed this unit that was larger than the norm, larger than everyone else does. And mm -hmm. turns out there's a, a demand, and it sounds like a, a fairly large demand for multi-generational housing. And then you talked through some of um, the aspects of the development portion, the doing um, you know, in, in, in an acquisition context, that would be the managing and you're in the context of development, the actual, the actual, um, entitlement construction, mm -hmm. uh, phase of, of the doing. Let's talk a little bit about capital. Mm -hmm. So, um, I found when you're in a, when you're in the box, it's easier to, to raise capital than when you're outside the box. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, you need to be a little outside the box in order to carve out a niche in order to compete. Yeah. Right. So, um, Describe for us your capital strategy, both debt and equity, um, to the degree that you know you can share details. Great, but um, yeah. are, are you are you are you raising institutional equity? Are you raising kind of friends and family money or, or syndicating? How does that work? And, and what's your your reasoning for your capital strategy? Yeah, so the the capital strategies evolved over time. So historically, we were institutionally sourcing equity and debt. You know, big big you know institutional grade projects. You know, larger you know hundred plus unit you know apartment projects. Yep. And so that's like that was our historical background. And then the companies I worked for even previously to that, Coffin and Road, and another company were both institutionally sourced capital. So, but as we got into this uh, this initial phase of the UTH model we very specifically did small projects because again, this experimental phase, I didn't want to take on really, you know, I didn't want to do a hundred units of five bedroom when no one has ever done that. Like I yeah. just like, <laughs> I, I, like I've, like I've, I've done that and been, you know, partners with people who are like, Hey, let's go big, you know, soon. And, you know, in a couple of cases took some bets and, you know, it, it worked against us. Like we, yeah. we weren't, we weren't prepared and having gone through a process of testing to know all the, you know, the variables that we needed to pay attention to. Of course, in development, as you know, Spencer, like there's certain variables, costs and rents and operating expenses that, you know, 
but you can't really know when you create a brand new product type how that really performs so we started small what i call the demonstration phase and that was all basically smaller investors so high net worth small family office um not even friends and family it was really just like i had a i had a cadre of people that i knew who would invest at the size of equity that we had at the time um and that would be wouldn't be stuck on this like such an extreme end of the spectrum of the product type right yeah. like it's like five bedrooms like even now we talk to lenders and they're like wow five bedrooms really <laughs> like that's I, i've never heard of that and, and i like i'm used to that like i'm prepared now what is a talk to new people that we're going to get that reaction. So the demonstration phase was to do exactly that was to raise capital on a smaller basis with more entrepreneurial high net worth and family offices that knew us and knew our capabilities and trusted us that we could go down the path of this. Um, and, and we did that. We actually did a four project series in the demonstration phase to prove the model did really well. I think our average IRR on, on capital was 23.06. I got wow. a little bit updating to do, but very healthy, right? No problem. Demand was there. The rents continued to go up. Um, so, so that turned out to be really well. And then as we finished that, we moved into now the product, what we're in is the production phase, I call it, which is just basically bigger projects, more projects, you know, more into the standard development model that we've practiced historically. And then that moves us now in the institutional capital domain. And in fact, right now we're in the process of raising a, you know, fairly large uh, private equity fund that will be purely focused on developing several of these UTH projects throughout Southern California, hmm. just as a, you know, scaling solution to trying to do multiple projects. And, but it's, it's really, you, you guys will recognize this, but I can't tell you, I mean, we did the demonstration phase because I wanted to prove to myself that the product would work. Like I was like, I, I, I go, I think this works. You know, we saw that first project and, but like, I needed to prove it to myself over and over, but we learned so many lessons in the operation production phase of, you know, right subs and right specs and, Hey, we've got the right HVAC equipment and, you know, how, how are the, how's the trust manufacturer working with this and, you know, networks of trade partners. I can't tell you, and we're, and we're still continuing to learn, but that demonstration phase was so valuable. Now as we're into raising the fund, it is the most valuable thing because the question becomes, well, how do you know this is going to work? Yeah. And what I'm, what I'm experiencing with investors, they go, yeah, we have other people that are innovating, innovating new housing types, um, but they've never done it. And so they're coming to raise capital and they've never done it. And not only have you done it, um, but you actually have a pipeline of deals. So our mm -hmm. fund won't be a blind, you know, blind pool. It will have, you know, not, not the entirety of the fund will is identified, but we actually have a series of projects. So we, and, and, and you know, I would love to say we, we, we knew all this up front. What I did do, though, fundamentally was to be um, prudent, like is the word I use, where you go take some risk, but do it in a way that you won't be destroyed if it goes against you. You proved it. OK, so do it again, maybe a bit, little bit bigger project, maybe different location. And then you do that in several steps. And look, I've worked with people in the development business that were like, dude, what, you know, what are you doing? Like, you know, you're doing a seven unit project, a 15 unit project. I mean, I've never done that small in my life, guys, yeah. like really. But I was really uh, encouraged um, to watch the process fulfill and it fulfilled positively, I'm glad to say. But we didn't know that at the time. I mean, it could have we got got kicked in the teeth. So. Right. I, I don't know if that answers the question exactly, yeah, it does. But, it's, but it's been evolving. I, We're testing as we go along. We're I, I want to while we do it. And, you know, and then you get to a place where you go, I feel very comfortable in all my variables and I can sit in front of an investor and go, yes, we've done it. Here's our returns. Here's our costs. Here's our team. Here's our trade. Here's our land. All the things that go into the development model. And we've like tested those at several occasions. Each I, of I want to, I want to just jump. I'm having so many just, thoughts. I mean, it, it, even from just a business perspective, but if I reflect back on some of the, uh, of the topics and things we were talking about in uh, season three, we definitely miss things because uh, Michael Spencer and I have a dynamic when we're talking about deal making and deal doing, but the nuance that you're talking about would definitely go back to a couple of things that we, that are, I think really layer in very valuable insight into doing this. And here, here's what I mean. 
strategy. We talked about creating a strategy. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you need to create, first of all, your first idea usually isn't the last and actionable idea you come up with. Mm -hmm. You come up with some kind of hypothesis, maybe you test it out a little bit and you find inefficiencies, right? Mm -hmm. And your ability to adapt is the, so first there's two things. One, identify the inefficiencies mm -hmm. and two, adapt as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think when I, I absolutely love th this is a case study in the entire what was that uh, episode three, I think maybe or four when we talked about strategy. This is a case study. It really in is doing that uh, flawlessly. And sometimes, you know, what, like you said, and, and maybe I don't like it when people say we got lucky because honestly, luck is, you know, Opportunities like a bus, there's one coming around all the time. If you <laughs> miss one, you're good. You're good. Yeah. You're on the next one. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it took the experience and knowledge that you had to identify an inefficiency and opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so from a person listening to this and I, I've, Scott, this has been awesome. I've just been sitting here listening to all of these actual real life events. And I'm like, man, this guy is living everything he did. He did the right thing. He got a strategy niche down. He adapted and you know, you do the, the everybody today, we all want to, we all want everything too quick. You know, we no delayed gratification. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that you have the wherewithal to think, listen, I'm not even going to take this to investors until I've proven it. Mm -hmm. That speaks to your character. That speaks to your, to just your experience as a business person. Because there are so many people who do not want to put in the initial reps and like, hey, this idea is good enough, buy it. Yeah, yeah. There's and a guy. You know, there's a guy named I, Richard Wilson who runs yeah. a, a group called the Family Office Club. He calls it push-ups. He got to do yeah. push-ups first. Yeah. So I always love yeah. that. Love that. Reps, well, I love that. And yeah. there's there's one there's one phrase that I live by, and that is people vote with their wallets. Okay. And so if you don't have a voting consensus, that means something, you don't really have anything. Ideas, uh, ideas are like, you know, they're, they're all over the place. Yeah. Well, whether or not our, it's as our deals, right? Like exactly. So, mm -hmm. so just, just yeah. a couple points there. So the, the, a, a lot of this came from, you know, you described me as season that I laughed because like, you know, you, you guys, you know, you've been through it and, and, you know, like it, it wasn't flawless. It was like a lot of, you know, like sleepless nights. I mean, you course, know, no yeah. about it. Right. Um, but I, but it really was like from those lessons in 2008, when you saw, I, I saw what didn't work or I, or maybe the better way to say it is at the time, the way our company was structured, we did a lot of product that, you know, was sort of seemed to be the hot, like commodity, right. Um, condos in this particular instance, it turned out to be a total disaster. I mean, we we like we we got it like we we made you know lemonade out of lemons at the end of the day, but it was like brutal, and it really taught me that I don't ever want to be in that position again, where I'm going to be in the like the the middle of the pack. I mean, we've always been a niche player. Like doing urban infill in 2000 was like, I mean, people thought we were from Mars, man. Like you want to go into downtown, you know, LA, that place sucks, right? And we, so we've always been sort of niche oriented. But when I described all the big boys coming with all their product, like to me, I was like, oh, that's a, that's a sign. Like I got to be uh, cognizant of that. And I think to what your point is, Sam, a lot of particularly people who are new in the business they look at the, the 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 pack as the place to go. They actually go to the pack and might even settle yes. right in the middle of it. Yeah. And yes. people who've done it a while, they go, no, maybe I want to be on the periphery, but I don't want to be right in the middle. Because if particularly if the recession comes against you and you're in the middle of the pack on rents or product yeah. type or location or whatever, right? The, all the big boys will eat your lunch all day yes. long, right? Like, you know, the, in fact, the thought I always came with is if I'm, going to head to head on a studio unit in downtown Long Beach against the big boys, they will eat my lunch on, on rent de deductions or reductions in a recession, right? They can drop their rents, man. They got whatever billions in, in the bank. And I'm not being facetious here. This is like literally true. Yeah. And so part of it is to be able to compete effectively 
um, in a in a domain that's not overly you know saturated, right? So that's the strategic part about it. I'll share a quick example. So I had a guy call me, and I think he was looking at some deal in like Chattanooga, right? Um, it was a value add deal, and he just called me just as a favor to talk to him, and so I gave him some advice. Or no, he was developing a new building in Chattanooga, and he said, "I said, what's your mix?" He goes, "Oh, it's all two bedrooms." I go, "Okay, like why did you choose that?" He goes, well, "Okay, because that's what everybody that that's the most." Favor, uh, I give it. There's most of that product in Chattanooga, and I, I think Chattanooga is the city. And I said that's exactly the place you don't want to go. Right. right, you don't want to do what everybody else is doing. Now, you there's an extreme. You can do what everybody else is doing and be in the middle of the pack, or you can be so far off the spectrum that you know if I did 25 bedroom apartments, you know people would think I was insane. Right, they'd be like, okay, so there's somewhere in the middle where you're going to be right at the margin where you can produce a valuable offer that's competitive, that's not overly saturated. And so you got to sort of like look for that. And I'm not, you know, I sit here and probably make it sound easy. It's not. And that, but that was part of the reason for the experiment is, but what I did know fundamentally is I don't want to compete in the middle of the pack. I want to have a differentiated offer. Like I knew, you know, but, but, you know, to your point, we learned a lot on execution, right? I mean, we're yeah. always, I mean, I've been developer for a really long time and we're always learning lessons and the, and the hardest part about it, just to share it all in here, is just to have the capability to admit to yourself that something didn't go well, and maybe there's a lesson there to learn. And in yeah. fact, with my staff all the time, like I, I, I learn now better, but I used to always ask people, well, why did that happen? Like, what yeah. happened there? And what I figured out after a couple of years, people thought I was going to punish them. Like I was lo- like on a witch hunt trying to find blame. And I go, oh, I'm not here to blame you. What I'm here to do is figure out what happened, what went wrong, and let's learn the lesson and let's put some practice or let some system in place so that never happens again. Because, yeah. you know, we we know mistakes will be made. We know it's inherent. The com- development process is incredibly complex. Um, and, you know, our job, my job is to look to reduce complexity. And that's systems, that's teams, that style of product, that's locations, that's financing, all those flow into that. And so we're looking to ever simplify, not, we can never make it simple, right? Development is complex and always yeah. will be, but you can always look to make something better, right? Like, you know, whatever, I mean, anything, I mean, there's like thousands of those that we've done over the time. So it's the strategy plus that learning. That iterative and, and Sam, process. Sort of, yeah. yeah. What Sam was saying, I'm sort of saying in different words, but you have to have both. Yeah. Right. Because you could have a great strategy and, and do crap execution. Like mm-hmm. you could be a great yeah. executor and be in the middle of the pack and be destroyed. Right. Neither he just summed up people. season three. <laughs> <laughs> That's the entire. You guys, please listen to season three. There's way more good stuff. But that is absolutely if, the, if there was one theme that I came away with is, man, I tell you what. Um, it's one thing to get out there and have a really good idea, but the money is made and the success is had by, ev- by, from the execution beginning to end and the execution is key. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say in my observation of people that are like in the development business that may be newer, I'm more often seeing poor execution than I'm seeing poor deal making or deal selection. Right. Yeah. Cause it, interesting. it's like a, like a, yeah. a okay deal. Well executed. will will make you money. That's right. 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 But a brilliant deal, poorly executed, you're going to lose. Right. And that's so, why if, if, uh, if you're a private investor, uh, y- you underwrite the deal. I'm th- I'm speaking to the LPs now in our audience who, who are looking to place money in different places. Um, but in the development game, especially it's really about the sponsor, the developer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And their ability to execute, um, yes. and and less about the deal. Scott, so thanks so much for your time. This is yeah. this has been great, Sam. I'll I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, um, I've come away with. I mean, th- these conversations are really fun, especially again on the heels of season three. Um, it, it's like we get to deep dive into all the cracks and crevices that we uncovered. Uh, during that, uh, you know, that production window where we came up with with uh, all of those awesome topics. But Scott has added a layer of color to this that I think is very valuable for people to uh, learn more and connect with you, Scott. What's the best way to do that? Uh, people can find us at our website. It's www.urbanpacific.com. 
Um, our contact info is on that. Uh, when people get there, there's a red button that says sign up. Sign up for Saturday. It's a just an e-blast we put out. And what what you'll get there is basically it's all like I read a lot uh, economic trends. You know, you know, new things happening in development business. Um, very pretty broad, but real estate focused. Um, and we curate a you know a, an email every Saturday, so that can be you know beneficial for folks to to read. Great. That's a great resource. Well, uh, thanks for being on here with us, Scott. This has been absolutely phenomenal. I've had a great time. I know Spencer has too. Yep. And the listeners, I'm sure, have loved it. So uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Adventures in CRE audio series. For show notes and additional resources, head over to www.adventuresincre.com slash audio series. Would you like to learn real estate financial modeling in a matter of weeks and do it with zero guesswork? If so, the ACRE Accelerator is for you. The Accelerator is a step-by-step case-based program designed to teach you exactly what you need to know and in the order you need to know it, so you can gain both the knowledge and experience to take your career to the next level. To see if the Accelerator is right for you, go to www.adventuresincre.com slash accelerator.